the reason that animal experimentation is an issue which bothers a lot of people uh, is not simply that animals are killed, but that they do suffer in laboratories. I think the fundamental reason why animals shouldn't be used in research is because we know full well that although they may not be able to reason, we know we, they, they can feel, they can feel pain in much the same way as we can. We would like to see legislation which totally protected animals from vivisection. We would like to see a situation where there were no experiments on animals. They're rather like people who used to say the earth is flat and they can cause a lot of trouble if many other people follow them in this, but it's quite clear that if medicine is going to advance, this type of work has got to continue in a controlled and humane way. Uh, if the community doesn't want a, a, any advances in medicine and surgery, then all experiments uh, should be stopped. Hello. Health and safety. The acceptable face of medicine today. <laughs> we take it for granted that vaccines are effective and safe. The benefits of modern medicine and surgery have transformed the prospects of life. Few would want it otherwise, but the argument is not about ends, but means. For our confidence in the surgeon's skill and the drugs he uses, depend upon research and testing on animals. The same is true of almost everything we use around the home. Washing up liquid in the kitchen sink, spray on oven cleaner, furniture polish in the dining room. Whatever we touch, we expect absolute safety. The price of our sense of security is experiments on animals. Four and a half million of them a year, 90,000 a week. Almost two thirds of these are safety and screening tests. Everything from pharmaceutical and household products to farm and garden sprays. The remaining third are used in medical, scientific and agricultural research. The most widely used species are mice almost three million of them a year at the last count. With a further one million rats, the rodent contribution to animal experiments is 86% of the total. But it's the 11,000 dogs and 7,000 cats that attract most public concern. By contrast, the RSPCA destroy over 100,000 unwanted domestic pets each year. But experiments on animals provoke special emotions. To deal with them, there is special legislation. If there wasn't, scientists would risk prosecution. As it is, they are protected by the 1876 Cruelty to Animals Act. This authorizes the Home Office to license individuals to use animals which for medical, physiological or other scientific purposes are subjected when alive to experiments calculated to inflict pain. Attached to every license is the condition that if an animal at any time during an experiment suffers severe pain, which is likely to endure, that animal must be painlessly killed. I think the act is a farce. Angela Walder is a leading campaigner against vivisection. Um, the only thing within the 1876 Act which should protect animals is the pain condition. And the pain condition is not in fact law. It is an administrative process attached to the licensing of research workers. So in fact in this country you can subject animals to severe and enduring pain for as long as you like and there is no recourse in law. Your pet could finish up in a bit of the street market. Can you say you care about animals? Can you say you feel sorry for these animals? Sunday morning in London's Club Row, a regular gathering place for the anti-vivisection lobby. Then it's got no one to give your money to the traders in the street market, please. Their target is a small pet market which they claim deals largely in stolen pets destined for research. Such allegations are commonplace, but hard evidence is scarce. The demonstrators are usually drawn from four separate groups. The RSPCA, Animal Aid, the National Anti-Vivisection Society, and the militant British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection. 
I now believe that the British Union for Abolition for the Section will go out very much more to support the activists within the movement. They've tried for a hundred years to get reformed by political means and by using the political, hopefully democratic process, and it obviously doesn't work. And that's a conclusion already reached by the underground Animal Liberation Front. They've resorted to daubing the homes and property of those involved in animal experiments and breaking into laboratories to liberate animals in open defiance of the law. The first time uh, I was put in, in jail was in 1975 and that was for causing about £60,000 worth of damage to vivisection laboratories, places where animals were bred for vivisection and um, other places where cruelty to animals uh, took place. Um, if during the war people had broken into concentration camps and damaged equipment and released the prisoners, that would have been against the law of Nazi Germany. As far as painting gra uh, graffiti, painting slogans on the homes of vivisectors, I think that's, that's totally, totally okay because it does reveal to uh, that person's neighbours um, what he's involved in. I think that's very important. The activities of the Animal Liberation Front may have caught the sympathy of certain Fleet Street tabloids. Note, the beagle was rescued rather than stolen. But they've also made the research establishment nervous and defensive. Where permission to film was granted, it was usually conditional. No identification of the company or location. No interviews. No faces. All for fear of attracting the attention of the ALF. It was left to industry spokesmen to do the talking. Certainly there is fear because... Uh, Dr. Eric Snell represents Britain's huge pharmaceutical industry. They've managed very skillfully to ignore the benefits of medical experimentation in their propaganda and the fact that it's largely carried out on rodents and to emphasize instead on a very misleading, exaggerated and lurid campaign of advertising that is portraying quite the wrong picture of the majority of this type of animal experimentation. The people don't want to be identified if they're working in laboratories in case... Lord Perry presents the case for the scientists. But there are a small group of, of extremists who have been indulging in, frankly, criminal activities. There have been attacks on, on laboratories, and worse than that, attacks on people's private property and threats to their wives and children. And no wonder they, they, they are reluctant to be to be exposed to that sort of thing. I certainly wouldn't call them animal lovers, no. Um, David Walker speaks for Britain's six contract research laboratories. We deplore the um, violence, uh, the theft, and the criminal acts of the anti vivisection lobby, particularly the ALF. The attack we sustained, the theft that we, we incurred, was during the night. But recently, life science research, this was a daylight attack and theft of vehicles with considerable damage to uh, microscopes and other equipment in broad daylight. The break-in at life science in Essex one quiet Sunday afternoon was a typical ALF operation. Ignoring the lone security guard at the main gates, the raiders burst through the rear entrance. Armed with iron bars and wire cutters, they headed for the nearest laboratory building. Files were taken, microscopes and other equipment were wrecked, a van parked outside was also badly damaged. As the police arrived, the raiders fled, taking five beagles with them. It was all over in minutes. This is a similar contract research laboratory where we were invited inside to film. Our arrival coincided with the intake of a number of four-month-old beagles from a specialist supplier. All the dogs used in these places are purpose-bred. It's important to know their history and that they're disease-free. These dogs were to be used for what's called a short-term toxicity trial. After 14 days acclimatization, they would be dosed with a test substance for a further two weeks. Then, 
they would be killed and their body tissues examined for harmful effects. Beagles are a favoured breed for this sort of work because their short hair makes them easy to handle and keep clean. They have a friendly nature and react well to confinement. These specially bred dogs are expensive. They cost the laboratories up to 300 pounds each. Unlike beagles, almost none of the 5,000 primates used in Britain are purpose-bred. Over 80% of them are caught in the wild, like these baboons from East Africa. They're still quite common. The demands for research worldwide have threatened the survival of some other species. It's become a controversial trade. If you take uh, primates from the wild, there is a lot of suffering involved simply in the catching. Then in the transportation, you do in fact lose a lot of primates on the way. Um, they die of shock, disease. In some instances, for example, where you're taking chimps, the practice of the natives who catch them is to kill the mother to get the baby because female um, adult chimps with babies would not be handleable. So they take the babies and kill the mother. According to the Primate Protection League, for every 10 primates trapped in the wild, only four make it to the research laboratory. Most primates are social animals, and they live in troops in the wild. If you house them in individual cages, as they are housed in laboratories, before you've even done a procedure, the animal is suffering. It's suffering anxiety, fear, distress, loneliness, and misery. And I've seen these primates in cages, and I find it very disturbing indeed to see them under these conditions. These baboons were being dosed with a range of five concentrations of a new heart drug undergoing tests for a client. The highest concentration, the red label, must by regulation be strong enough to cause harmful effects to the animal. The daily dosing will last from two to four weeks. This sort of test, called a subacute toxicity trial, is compulsory for all new medicines and drugs destined for the commercial market. Again, by law, these products must be tested on at least two different species, one of which must be a non-rodent. With drugs intended for use in man, that non-rodent is usually a primate. One never knows exactly what the likely human toxicity of a chemical is going to be until it's used in man, these animal tests are only a guide and each animal may react differently. Uh, some like man, some not like man. Uh, so a range of animals is necessary to get the best information of the likely human response. And of course, you spoke of monkeys, that is closer to the animal species and for some um, chemicals more likely to mimic man in its response to them. Animals are not people, they respond differently. For example, in the testing of drugs, their metabolism is different, their excretion is different, and the results we obtain are really quite invalid. So the animals are not only suffering, they're suffering in vain. Come on. Come on, the design of the primate cages has one special feature. The back can be cranked forward to restrain the animal at the front. This is used at the end of the test period when the baboons are, in laboratory terminology, sacrificed. The vital organs are removed and prepared for post-mortem examination. Meticulous records are kept throughout the test in the client's file 
What the microscope later reveals could be the make or break of a drug that's taken perhaps 10 years and 50 million pounds to develop. It's a game only the giant multinationals can afford to play. Companies like Bayer, for instance, their trademark towers over their hometown of Leverkusen on the banks of the Rhine. Bayer's fortunes were secured 80 years ago with the discovery of aspirin. Ironically, if it were submitted to today's stringent tests, it would probably fail. Bayer now turn out over 500 different products. The competition to satisfy new markets is intense, but the legal consequences of letting just one drug slip through the safety net are enormous. The minimum animal testing program for all EEC countries is laid down in the rules governing medicaments in the European community. Most successful drugs, though, are marketed worldwide, and other countries, notably the United States and Japan, have different test standards. Regulations are different in different countries. They're different for different products. They're different for different purposes. For example, if you're exporting or importing or transporting, uh, you have to fill in various, uh, fulfill various sets of regulations, and they're all different. If these regulations were standardized, there would be a lot less repetition and duplication, and therefore you would reduce suffering immediately um, simply by doing that. But I think also they need to be modified because in many instances they are not the most rational um, tests which are prescribed by the bureaucrats. For example, with the LD50 test, which is a very crude test using death as its endpoint, in many instances all you, you, the scientist needs to know is an approximate measure. He really wants to simply grade the chemical, whether it's very toxic, whether it's not too toxic, or whether it's not toxic at all. You don't need a precise LD50 figure for that. LD50 stands for lethal dose 50%, and it's an estimate of the size of dose that would kill half the animals in a group. An LD50 figure is used as a guide to the acute toxicity of a substance. In other words, how much of it would have to be taken to be fatal. It is demanded for most new products, either for human use, like medicines and cosmetics, or products open to accidental misuse, like herbicides and cleaning materials. These rats are being used for an LD50 test on a sample of the insecticide malathion. The rats are dosed for the range of concentrations, the size of dose being related to body weight. Here, only two rats per group are being used, but often as many as ten animals per group may be required. After an hour, some of the rats begin to show symptoms of distress, shivering, paralysis, and weeping from the eyes. After two hours, those dosed with the highest concentrations are dead. Those in the second group are close to death. Others too may die before the end of the test period, which is usually at least a week. The survivor's fortune is short-lived. All animals in LD50 tests are killed and undergo post-mortem. This controversial test, which besides dosing can also include inhalation and skin tests and clearly involves suffering, has itself been questioned by scientists. If we take the highly criticized LD50 assay, for instance, although this at the present time is required by statute in most countries in the uh, development of, of a drug toxicity program, I, and I think most of my colleagues in contract research, um, are not uh, very much in favour with this particular test. Um, it, 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 it can use quite a large number of animals, and the information received from this is not so valuable as uh, a more in-depth investigation on a smaller number. Caught in the middle of the argument over animal testing 
is the veterinary profession. They, too, are very unhappy about the LD50 test. Uh, the LD50 test uh, sometimes has to be taken to almost ridiculous extremes. I think it's probably reasonable to say if any substance administered in a hundred times dose doesn't hurt anybody or hurt any animal, there's no need to go into a thousand times or ten thousand times the dose. A lot of the testing is demanded by vociferous lobbies. There's one lobby that wants no animals used, there's another lobby that wants absolute safety, and the safety lobby wants animal testing. The two are irreconcilable. The LD50 test although highly contentious, is justified by the demands of the law. The same cannot be said of smoking tests. Despite a government health warning on every packet, high cigarette consumption continues, and research into its ill effects goes on. Since the outcry over the smoking beagles, tests like these are now confined to rats. They're called nose-only inhalation tests. Rats spend an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon for up to four weeks, monitoring the middle tower strength. Meanwhile, the machine puffs 70 cigarettes an hour. The latest figures show that 41,000 animals a year are used in forced inhalation tests like these. Most of them are on industrial gases and dusts, but nearly 2,000 were on tobacco. I would defend research on smoking materials by stating that there is, uh, certainly with, with cigarette smoke, um, an enormous danger. It is probably the, the sing single biggest killer in, in the world nowadays. Um, and while this is the situation, while people smoke, I think that we are uh, morally obliged to investigate it. And if this, and it does, require the use of animals, yes, um, I, I see no reason why it shouldn't continue. I don't think testing them on animals is actually going to safeguard people's health. I think there is sufficient evidence now to show that, that cigarettes are, are toxic to man. It would be wrong to assume that all experiments require the animals to be killed. These rabbits, for instance, can live for several years and according to laboratory staff, suffer little more than a loss of dignity. They are being used in one of the commonest procedures, the pyrogen test. Quite simply, this is a test to detect unwanted toxins called pyrogens, which, if present, will cause a rise in body temperature. Each rabbit is equipped with a rectal temperature probe and put into a restraining yoke. They are then injected in the air with the test substance. Any pyrogen impurity will register as a rise in body temperature. The rabbits may sit there for several hours, and they can undergo this test as often as once a week. Each rabbit will be recorded under the 1876 Act as an experiment performed without anaesthetic. 80% of the 4.5 million experiments carried out each year in vivisection laboratories use no anaesthetic but few are as benign as the pyrogen test. The only people with the right of unimpeded access to these places are the Home Office Inspectorate.
There are just 15 inspectors to cover the whole of Britain. Eight of them are vets, seven are doctors. With 550 registered places and 21,000 licensees to inspect, their role is more administrator than policeman. There's going to come a time when you're going to have to replace some of these racks, you know. You yes, yes we're, we're looking into Think that of the budget there. next year. Frequency of visits can range from once a month to once a year, all of them supposedly random and unannounced. To uh, get an idea of uh, how random it is, uh, you simply have to see me, perhaps, at Euston Station in the morning, uh, saying, well, I wonder where I should go this morning. Uh, they don't know I'm coming um, until I arrive. And we do find that uh, our arrival and the um, name Home Office Inspector does strike a little awe in people's minds, and it does make them look at their consciences and see if they need dusting. Uh, and we aim to keep it that way. Yeah, they look pretty happy, I think. I'd just like to have a look at this slot. Yes, certainly. The rats in this room had been injected in the feet as part of an experiment. One of the duties of an inspector is to assess whether such a procedure falls within the pain condition of the license. We are dealing with uh, an act of parliament which permits some pain. Uh, the question is how much, and bearing in mind that we have no actual units of measurement. However, um, if you see an animal and you get to know the signs, uh, you have some idea of pain and discomfort, and gradually you build a sort of mental scale uh, in your mind. I find it helpful actually to repeat the words of the condition on the licenses when I'm looking at these. Now, is that or is that not? likely to endure at all. These kind of things come as a sort of balance, and one comes to a conclusion and one hopes it's the right one. But nevertheless, the one executive power we have is to stop an experiment immediately. But in the last 106 years, since the Cruelty to Animals Act was introduced, there has only been one successful prosecution, and that was almost 70 years ago. I think the answer is that we practice what we would call preventive medicine. In other words, we feel that if we are doing our job correctly, uh, things should never get to the stage of having to require prosecution. It should all be done way before that. But critics point out that 10 of the 15 Home Office inspectors have previously held vivisection licenses. They claim their impartiality is open to doubt. I think the fact that they have worked as experimenters, the fact that they work alongside experimenters, cannot be held to be a weakness in the system. It seems to me to be a strength in the system. It is their job, of course, to make sure that the law is properly carried out. They're dedicated people, and the basis of their whole position is to try to avoid cruelty to animals. But um, I don't think it really is a powerful argument to say you shouldn't have people who know what they're talking about. Something old, something new, something... My effigy has been burnt a number of times, um, and I've had uh, uh, phone calls, you know, uh, in the small, small hours of the night, abusive phone calls and a great deal of, uh, uh, of intemperate uh, language in, in letters. Dr. Barry Cross, director of the Institute of Animal Physiology at Babram near Cambridge. The privacy of this peaceful country house, with its sheep grazing in the park, was shattered three years ago by a hostile campaign in the press. Banner headlines proclaimed Babram Hall as Frankenstein's farm. Allegations were made of grotesque experiments. The Animal Liberation Front broke in and snatched some pictures. Fleet Street's demands for access were only partially met. Now some basic questions can be answered. This is a research institute, and uh, its uh, sole function is to advance knowledge uh, re related to animals, domestic animals primarily, so as to increase the production of food for the British population. In pursuit of those aims, a wide range of work is done at Babram. This is a simple behaviour study on pigs who have been taught to feed themselves 
by pressing a button. The dominant pig does all the work, while the other grabs what food it can before being heaved out of the way. More sophisticated studies use electrodes surgically implanted into the animal. This sheep has a small transmitter under the skin of its back, while an electrode on the horn completes the sensitive monitoring circuit. The animal's movements and heart rate in response to stress are recorded by a remote camera. Information provided by behavioral studies like these lead, it's claimed, to better conditions for animals on the farm. Other routine work on sheep is done on digestion and makes use of the so-called rumen fistula. And this is a standard operation which has been used in agriculture for at least 50 years for studying digestive processes in ruminants. And it enables one to collect samples from the ingester of the ruminant stomach, which is totally different from the human. Uh, it's a big fermentation vat where lots of chemical processes go on, mediated by bacteria and fungi and so on. So that there's no way really of, dis of deciding what nutrients are getting into the bloodstream except by actually plunging in and uh, taking them out and analyzing them. If you like, I can uh, remove the bun so that you can see, first of all, that the operation provides no stress to the animal and enables one to collect samples from the large fermentation vat of the rumen quite simply. Of course, the sheep is a little bit camera shy, but otherwise he's a very friendly sheep and a great pet in the biochemistry laboratory where we are at the moment. Come on. To complete this work on digestion, the sheep also has catheters inserted into the blood vessels entering and leaving the liver. This allows blood samples to be easily extracted. There is a prize-winning Jersey herd at Babram, and one of the cows illustrates another aspect of the Institute's work. Well, this is Victoria, as you can see, a very fine specimen of a Jersey cow and she's had a little plastic operation on the carotid artery whereby it's enfolded in a layer of skin um, right round it and this means that uh, the scientists can obtain samples of arterial blood very simply without disturbing the animal in any way. Victoria's also had another exteriorized vessel on the mammary vein down here underneath which enables uh, blood samples to be taken painlessly to give uh, evidence about the process of milk secretion. Victoria, as you can see, is heavy in calf and is expected to produce its calf in a very few days. Let's again. I feel very strongly that uh, the suffering that goes on in this institute is very much less than that which goes on outside. I've had a vivisection license myself for over 30 years, and I'm quite satisfied that the standards of animal treatment and animal care and surgical skill in this institute are higher and the highest I've ever encountered anywhere. Uh, so I am convinced that uh, the uh, level of inconvenience, I'd rather put it at that level, inconvenience rather than suffering, that animals um, are subjected to here is certainly no greater than that of animals on farms or even animals used for sport, steeplechasing and so on. Perhaps the most controversial work carried out at the Institute is a transplant operation on goats. Although the licensee in charge of the experiment wouldn't permit filming for fear of repercussions, Dr. Cross was happy to explain what it was all about. Well, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's an it's a extremely bland operation. The uh, mammary gland, of course, is a skin gland, and therefore it's really a skin graft. But for some reason that I don't think we fully understand, the public uh, has a very emotional reaction to anything that involves uh, mammary glands. The uh, essential thing about the operation is that one of the two 
mammary glands is carefully removed from the inguinal site and uh, grafted to the carotid artery and uh, jugular vein of the neck. Now this uh, operation it may sound very terrifying, but within two days of the operation, the uh, transplanted gland is giving perfectly normal yields of milk. Now any farmer will know that uh, milk yield is the most sensitive index of stress. So if the operation was causing the animal any uh, significant degree of stress, it would almost certainly mean that the milk yield would drop to nothing. Dr. Cross emphasized that only with the gland in this position is it possible to monitor exactly what nutrients enter and leave it. He's convinced that this work has led to important new knowledge of the process of milk production and secretion. Other research to cause alarm in the press was work in genetics, the first successful crossing of a goat with a sheep. The innocent looking result was baby sham, seen here with her goat mother and Barbary sheep father. But despite the controversy, Dr. Cross remains proud of his institute's achievements, which, as he's keen to point out, reach beyond agriculture. Recently, uh, there's been quite a lot of media coverage of the test tube baby saga in, uh, in the uh, Stepto Edwards Circus in Cambridge. And I'm sure that uh, they would be the first to recognize that their work would not have been possible without animal research which was done in this institute. Addenbrooke's Hospital, another Cambridge institution with an international reputation, this time for liver and kidney transplants. Some aspects of surgery are entirely dependent on uh, the operation being perfected, first of all, in animals. The pioneer of the work on transplants, Professor Roy Kahn, likes to emphasize medicine's debt to animal experiments. Uh, on the epidemiological side, uh, all vaccination and preventative uh, types of immunization really depends on animal experiments. Uh, Another very good example is tuberculosis, which used to be a very major killer, and particularly again of young people in the United Kingdom. And this has been eliminated uh, partly by the development of antibiotics, which had to be studied in animals, and also partly by the development of immunization, BCG, which again is uh, something that is developed from animal experiments. Fact, but Professor Kahn's outspoken defense of vivisection has also made him a target for personal abuse. I've certainly been woken up in the middle of the night after being operating for several hours into the night and been woken up an hour later. And of course that is very unpleasant for me, but it also is not fair on the patient who's going to be operated on being the next morning. So the abdomen has been prepared now with some idea. I'm going to make a long incision, a whole length of the, uh, the rat's belly, down through the skin. Rats provide the basic model for much of the work at Addenbrooke's. Here, surgeons working with Professor Kahn are investigating new ways of treating diabetes. At present, most diabetics have to inject themselves twice a day with insulin. This research is seeking a permanent cure by transplanting the cells of the pancreas that produce the insulin, the so-called islets of Langerhans. The first stage of the operation involves the removal of the pancreas from a number of anaesthetized rats, a delicate but rather bloody procedure. It has a very rich blood supply, as you can see from the amount of bleeding I've produced. And then we put the pancreas again into a, an ice-cold solution. Uh, at the end of uh, this removal, I make a cut through the diaphragm into the chest cavity of the rat and sacrifice the animal by dividing the great vessels in the chest so that the animal uh, doesn't recover from the anaesthetic. We use uh, a number of animals for each experiment. The reason behind uh, all of this is that if you wish to do any studies of immunology, that is, of why uh, any graft is rejected uh, by another individual, you must do it on intact live animals. It's not the sort of research that you can do in a test tube because the responses of the animal uh, are quite individual between different strains and the techniques involved uh, with organs and the tissue graft as such uh, that the uh, methodology cannot be worked out except in the living animal. Uh, for this reason, if, if we're to make 
any serious progress in transplantation of islets for diabetic patients, I think we need to do it uh, in the laboratory with animals. It's not a problem that we're going to be able to solve in a test tube. Well, one of the things we have to talk about this morning is the, uh, how far uh, it is uh, acceptable in moral and public opinion uh, to use animals for painful experiments. Now, one of the ideas that's been... Lord Houghton is chairman of the Committee for the Reform of Animal Experiments. It meets regularly to discuss reform of the 1876 Act, which the committee feels does little to control painful experiments. Their secretary is Clive Holland. Remember, when the 1876 Act came in, there were only some 350-odd experiments a year on animals. Now we're talking in terms of millions, up to five million a year. The situation is now a multi-million pound business, quite apart from the research aspect of it, so that we need to have tighter controls and certainly the, the most important issue is how much pain is legally permitted to be uh, inflicted upon animals. Uh, our view, and I hope the British government view, is that there is a degree of pain which is totally and utterly unacceptable. If pain is severe, either by duration or by intensity, and cannot be relieved, then our view is that animal must be destroyed even if you completely spoil the experiment, the animal must come first. Defining severe pain is one of the main difficulties in the whole debate on animal experimentation. In particular, how can human feelings of pain be related to laboratory animals? If you take, uh, for instance, an example of uh, running around after an operation, uh, a rat that's had an operation, say, on its abdomen will be running around almost within uh, minutes of recovering from the anaesthetic, whereas a human being wouldn't because the pain would be too much and he would rather stay in bed. Most scientists seem to agree that far too little is known about the nature of pain. Consequently, anti-vivisectionists feel that too much is left to the judgment of the licensee. The scientist simply regards the animal as a legitimate tool for his purposes. But I think there is a sort of blinker um, which the scientist has. Sometimes I talk to people about suffering in their experiments, and I'm quite convinced that, you know, if, if you took anybody off the street and said, is this animal suffering, the person would say yes. But the scientist will often say, oh no, the animal isn't suffering. It, it, it's quite clear that it's not suffering, and it's not clear at all. I feel that there is a great danger in research, in the strange love theory. I Mike Seymour Rouse the... is an animal welfare campaigner based in Brussels. I, during the war, was in a concentration camp. Now, during the war, I learned quite a lot during the time I was in that concentration camp. I was in Dachau for this period. I, myself, was experimented on by a German doctor called Felgebel. And Felgebel was later sentenced. But when he was asked in the trial why he continued with his experiments, he said, Neugierigkeit, which never means in English inquisitiveness. And that I honestly feel, to a lesser extent, persists today in some scientists, some, I'm not saying all, but some. One of the most effective lobbies against painful experiments has been aimed at the highly sensitive area of cosmetic testing. Beauty in Britain is a billion pound business, dominated by big international companies. Most of them are based in America, and much of the testing takes place there. The latest figures here show 31,000 cosmetic tests, less than 1% of the total, but still enough to attract the critics. It's the controversial Dray's tests that generate public concern. There are two basic types. This rabbit is being prepared for a skin irritancy test. These animals have sensitive light skins, and when cosmetics are applied, will give indications of harmful effects. 
Most new products will prove quite safe, but some will register unpleasant reaction. I think that unless we prevent new, new cosmetics coming on the market and simply say there won't be any more, but it's absolutely vital that you test them because some of the people who, who get cosmetics supply their babies with tender skin. I wouldn't like to see new creams put onto babies' bottoms which were liable to produce dermatitis. I'd rather have them tested in animals. The other Dre's test is the eye irritancy test. Again, albino white rabbits are most often used. In this case, eye ointments are being tested but other cosmetics and industrial products are also used in this way. A sensitivity chart enables comparisons to be made at intervals during the test. Cosmetic testing is an emotional issue and for some it's impossible to come to terms with. Actress Joanna Lumley is a leading campaigner for the cause of beauty without cruelty. I think the frivolity of it appalls me. And I think in the end it negates the whole point of beauty, which is almost always, unless you're the cruel witch, to do with love and gaiety and brightness and attractiveness. And I think that if you saw those little beasts being wired up or cut open or fed with stuff till they die, you'd rather go off it. You might go off the woman as well. All the cosmetics used by Joanna Lumley are made either from natural products or from substances tried and tested long ago. The trade name, Beauty Without Cruelty, guarantees just that. Why I use Beauty Without Cruelty is because it's good, simple stuff. Cunningly applied is as good as anything else, as everything is cunningly applied. There's no need to go to stuff which is 18 pounds a bottle. It just is, it, there's no, no point in it. However, the European Commission has plans for a directive that would mean hundreds of basic cosmetic ingredients would have to be resubmitted for test. Once again, beauty may have to call upon animals. Meanwhile, the pressure for alternatives is growing. The Fund for the Replacement of Animals and Medical Experiments, FRAME for short, is a trust set up to promote such work. For instance, using tissue and cell cultures for measuring toxicity instead of animals. But the science is in its infancy, and meaningful substitutes could be a long time coming. I think most politicians are attracted by the idea that there could be substitutes for using animals in experiments. And most politicians are appalled at the prospect of health and safety regulations, which may be good in themselves, meaning that the numbers of animals will go up from some 4,700,000 two years ago to some 25 million if these health and safety regulations are brought in. Outraged by such a prospect, the anti-vivisection movement is gaining momentum. Raids on research laboratories and public demonstrations are becoming more frequent and increasingly violent. For many protesters, the issue is simple. All experiments on animals are morally unjustified and should be banned. They are confident they could live with the consequences. But for the more moderate members of the anti-lobby, who value the benefits to society of vivisection, the issue is more complicated. They claim there is too much secrecy and lack of openness and seek to reduce the number of animal experiments by tightening up the existing act. They want a stronger Home Office inspectorate, working to much clearer definitions of severe and enduring pain and license applications to be considered on ethical as well as scientific grounds. The present government has pledged to update the 1876 Act, but time is running out. The demonstrations, the raids, the lobbying all add pressure. The animal welfare movement hasn't really understood how Parliament and politics works. 
the only way you get action is by putting sufficient pressure on politicians to force them to act. No government, neither a Conservative government, nor, let us be candid, a Labour government, is going to stir up this particular hornet's nest in the two years running up to a general election. Somehow or another, excuses will be found to delay the legislation. The Act has not run out of steam. Uh, it, it's obsolescent and it needs to be changed, but it's not yet at the stage when we can say that there is a crisis, if it has to continue in being for another year or so. But uh, we want to move ahead as soon as we can. where I am.